Welcome to Downtown Sports. My name is Downtown Stephen Brown, and in today's video, please do consider subscribing if you're not already subscribed to the channel because I like to think of our channel here or our community or these videos as discussion starters where I've learned a lot from you guys and hopefully you could say the same about me. And if you're new here, say hi down in the comment section because I do like responding to the vast majority of you guys and I'm going to have more time today to respond to your comments because it is Canada Day. So happy Canada Day to you. Happy John Tavares Day. Happy anniversary of that. Happy Independence Day as you're in the States a couple of days from now. And hopefully you guys are all enjoying the holidays um, responsibly and staying safe. And since today is the anniversary of John Tavares signing with the Toronto Maple Leafs, if you guys would like me to make a video talking about what if that didn't happen from the Maple Leafs perspective, you know, what if he just stayed on the island or if he went to San Jose or if he went to another team, uh, just if the Leafs didn't sign him from their perspective, let me know down in the comment section by commenting Tavares and I will do that video for you guys. But you got to make sure to subscribe as well. Make sure you're subscribed. And as always, there will be time codes in the description of this video to help you guys navigate through and see what we're talking about today. But in today's video, what if <laughs> the Toronto Maple Leafs lose in the play-in round and win the second phase of the draft lottery and get the opportunity to select Alexis Lafreniere? A lot of people are talking about this, so I figured I would weigh in and offer my perspective of the situation. And it makes me laugh because if the Leafs were to somehow lose to Columbus in the play-in round, they would then have a 12.5% chance at winning that first overall pick. All of the teams that lose in the play-in round would have a 12.5% at that pick. So no, I don't think that the Maple Leafs should tank the play-in round at a 12.5% chance at Alexis Lafreniere because at that point, yes, he is the consensus number one overall pick and he could help you win a Stanley Cup, but at the same time, um, you could just try to win the Stanley Cup this season with guys like Austin Matthews, John Tavares, William Nylander, and Mitch Marner. But let's go down the route of saying that they do lose in the play-in round and they do win the first overall pick. Well, then what happens after that? Now, if you guys remember back to when Matthews, Marner, and Nylander were on their entry-level deals, we had to worry about rookie bonuses and bonus overage charges, and that's because the base is 925 k for Alexis Lafreniere's contract, but then you have to worry about Schedule A bonuses, which are a maximum of 850 k and then Schedule B bonuses, which are a maximum of $2 million. And if he hits all of them, well, then great. That means that he had an amazing rookie season, and if he doesn't, he doesn't. But he could cost the Leafs up to 3 Point seven seven five million dollars against the cap so we need to budget for that moving forward and another thing with that is that if we were worrying about rookie bonuses and overage charges then we wouldn't be able to use long-term injury reserve as a way to gain assets in a trade or take advantage of it in any sort of way because rookie bonuses cannot be paid with LTIR money in order to use LTIR you need to be over the cap so if they did incur any rookie bonuses then that would lead to an overage charge the year after that and we want to try to avoid that so there's no using LTIR next season if we have to worry about rookie bonuses and this is just a really quick hypothetical armchair GM that I threw together to highlight this but the lease would be over the salary cap and incur an overage charge of 358k if Alexis Lafreniere hit all of those Schedule A and Schedule B bonuses, and like I said, we want him to do that if he's on our team because that would mean that he had an amazing rookie season, and that's the whole point of having him, for, for him to just play ridiculously stupidly well. So we want to worry about this. We want to be in this position of worrying about overage charges in terms of rookie bonuses for his contract. Does Travis Dermott hypothetical contract, does he take less? Does Ilya Mikheyev's hypothetical contract, does he take less? Um, you got to work that in or do you just roll the dice and do you swallow the 358k for the next season because you're so happy that you have the player and that he had an amazing season to begin with. But then the next question becomes, do you trade one of those forwards for defensemen and I think next season so in the 2020-21 season I think you just roll with this I don't think you make any trades and here's my explanation for it if William Nylander continues to be a 30 goal scorer and someone who puts up 60 or 70 points I think that he gives you a lot of value at about seven million dollars and I don't think that the Leafs could afford to trade him at that point because the Leafs need affordable players that give them value from their contracts on their team and with Mitch Marner, I think that trading him right now in the offseason, if you were to get Alexis Lafreniere, would be a mistake because Mitch Marner's trade value right now is at an all-time low, especially with the cap staying flat for a couple of seasons, with the contract negotiations that he had last summer. 
Um, with the type of season that he had, I mean, he was on pace for 93 points and his career high is 94, but signing a contract like that, you almost expect the guy to have either 40 or 50 goals in a season or put up 100 points, and he didn't do either of those things. So personally, I think it was a mistake for Mitch's career that he signed that much of an overmarket deal because it's putting expectations on him that I don't think he'll be able to live up to perennially. Because, I mean, it's a tall task. It's a lot to ask for for a player to be a perennial 40 or 50 goal scorer, and that's not his game. And it's hard to ask anyone to put up 100 points every single season. John Tavares is the captain of the team and he has a no movement clause so he's not getting dealt anywhere and to suggest that they should use a potential compliance buyout on the guy I, I think that that's equally as crazy as suggesting that Matthews should be on the trading block or you should be shopping him or listening to offers on him I it's not going to happen. But I tend to give John Tavares the benefit of the doubt for the season that he had this year, and maybe I should give the benefit of the doubt to Mitch Marner as well, because they both make about $11 million, and neither of them were on pace for 100 points or to score 40 or 50 goals. And I mean, John Tavares did play through a broken finger. He missed six games because of it, two weeks. And if any of you have broken a bone or a finger before, you know the recovery time is not two weeks. And to be playing high-level sports and training through a broken finger, I can understand why he maybe didn't score as many goals through that stretch. Ultimately, the team fell short of expectations this year, and of the core players, um, Mitch, Austin, Willie, John Tavares, Frederick Anderson, and Morgan Riley, it's really hard to just pinpoint and narrow it down which player's fault it was or more so than the other when it was kind of just the whole team collectively not kind of living up to expectations so I don't think anyone's individual performance this season is really indicative of what that player is I mean William Nylander kind of exceeded expectations so I'm going to take his name out of that group so Matthews Tavares Marner Anderson and Morgan Riley uh, if you're looking at those guys I don't think that it's fair to lay the blame on any one of those guys more so than the other and I mean with Matthews he was on pace for 57 goals so I don't think you could really blame him either but I'm not trying to lay blame here what I'm trying to say is Alexis Lafreniere or not I don't think this offseason or throughout next season I don't think that that's the right time to trade any one of those four guys regardless of what happens with the play-in round and the draft lottery and some people might call that arrogance but I just call it confidence because I know that this forward group would be the best in the entire NHL undoubtedly that's it's not up for debate at that point they're already top three or top five without Alexis Lafreniere. And there's going to be a narrative and there's going to be people saying that even with Alexis Lafreniere, the Maple Leafs wouldn't be cup contenders because they need to fix the defense. And to that, I say, that's a loser mentality. If you're not confident in your strengths and your ability, and this isn't just about hockey, this is about life in general. If you're not confident in your abilities and your strengths and you're constantly thinking about your insecurities and your weaknesses, then you're going to fail. You're going to fail a hundred out of a hundred times. You need to go in thinking that you're going to succeed because of your strengths and because of your abilities people don't realize how much of their mindset going into things actually affects the end result and if you want proof of that just look at this youtube channel make sure to like the video if you did like it and subscribe for more because more is always on the way and guys remember there is a power to speaking things into existence to having a positive or confident mindset when approaching new or difficult things i try to do it with the leafs all the time here on the channel and hopefully um it's effective to some degree because sometimes with this team you know you just you just don't really know what to say